Today is March 12, 2012, and this is AP Statistics at Berkeley High School, and here's the beginning of the end. We're going to revisit the idea of regression, and we're going to specifically look at inference for linear regression. We've looked at regression before. We looked at saying, can we find a relationship between two quantitative variables and doing so by calculating the line of best fit or the least squares regression line for some, for some set of data, x and y. Today we're actually going to do inference. We're going to combine two ideas. Inference, meaning looking at a sample and then trying to make a decision about what's going at the population level with the idea of linear regression where we have a single population on which we're collecting two quantitative variables from. Okay, so as with all inferential statistics, we'll be finding out and checking for the conditions that are appropriate for, for, for uh, performing inferential statistics on a linear regression. We will construct and interpret a confidence interval having to do with the slope beta of a regression line. We will perform a significant test about the slope beta for the regression line, and then also we'll be looking at computer output uh, in the form of mini tab output about how we can get that information out. Um, in this section, the calculator, uh, I'm sorry to say, will actually start to fail us. The calculator will not be doing everything that we need to do. So we're going to be more heavily dependent on looking at the computer output. But right, we'll, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. All right, so let's get started. Uh, we start with the idea that we can look at scatter plots to find out whether there's a linear relationship between two variables. Now, I believe we did this back in the fall, and we looked at data like, uh, is there a relationship between height and weight? And I think I collected all the weight data from all the males in the classroom, and we said, OK, is there a relationship with height? And we said, you know what, height, which, which one is the explanatory variable, which one's the response variable? We talked about putting the, the explanatory variable on the horizontal axis, the response variable on the vertical axis, doing the scatter plot, and saying, does there seem to be a relationship there? Scatter plot seems to be the plotted form that allows us to, to investigate whether there's a relationship. We also looked in that section about whether we could quantify the strength of a linear relationship. We did that with a, a value r. But let's say we collected that data, and let's say we looked at that relationship, and let's say that we think that there's a relationship there, but we're not sure. We're not sure whether what we're seeing is an artifact of a real relationship or whether we just got a lucky sample that things look like they happen by chance. We know that when we do these, these linear regressions, we typically don't have every single item from a population. When I collected the height and weight data back in the fall, I did it with the males in this class. Did I do it with all high school males? No, not even close. What we say is we have a sample, and that sample may if it's chosen well, i.e. randomly, represent an entire population, and then maybe we can infer that this height and weight relationship exists for all males, or all high school males. We think that when we do good sampling, we may infer things about the population. Well, let's go and let's start building a, a, a methodology for looking for, that, for the answer to that question. When we looked at that sample, did we see a real relationship that we can then say, I'm confident that the relationship is real, or, bless you, or could it happen by, by pure chance alone? Okay. A couple of things that also happened in the earlier things. We talked about uh, interpreting some, uh, 
the slope of a linear relationship. I want to revive that memory as well. The memory of for every, for whenever we look at a slope in, a, in some sort of linear relationship, we say, do we think, or what we see, if the slope is 5, for every change of one unit in the, would you put your Okay, for every, for every change of one unit in the explanatory variable, we see that slopes, the slope change in the, uh, in the response variable. But, is that exactly the relationship that we would see if we were, instead of looking at an entire, instead of looking at a sample, if we looked at the entire population? We take a sample, we do linear regression, we get a slope. But is that slope the true slope? Is that the slope that we would get if we... If we interviewed everyone in a population, is it a reasonable estimate? Is the slope that we get from the sample a reasonable estimate of the real slope? Can we say it's the center of an estimate and we maybe put margins of errors on the either side of it, like we did for a sample mean versus a population mean? In this section, we're going to try to investigate all of those, all of those questions. We're going to try to say, can we find out if the relationship is real? And if it is real, can we get a reasonable estimate of what we think the true slope is? recorded, uh, this is eruptions of Old Faithful at uh, Yellowstone National Park. There's two numbers that go along with each erup eruption. How long did the eruption last? That would be the duration. And how much interval was there between eruptions? That would be the, uh, the span of time between two eruptions. Have any of you ever been to Yellowstone? None. You. Okay, did you see Old Faithful? Yeah. Why is it called Old Faithful? And the answer is, ready? Because it's a geyser that actually goes off pretty regularly. So if you wait there long enough, in the case, uh, in the case of that, see that it says interval in minutes. The lowest of the, in the intervals is like around 40. The highest of the intervals are around 100 minutes, which means if you hang around there for at least an hour and a half, you're very likely to see an eruption of this geyser. Now, geysers, as you may recall from your geophysical science classes, are places where uh, hot water and steam erupt. It's a place where the water table and the, uh, uh, I forget what level of the, Earth's undersurface meet and then they cause eruptions of steam and, 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 uh, and hot water. So, Old Faithful, it faithfully goes off. Now, is there a relationship between the duration, how long it spouts off, and how long you had to wait? Well, if you look at that scatter, scatter plot, would you say that there's a relationship? If you, if you say there is, how would you, how would you Interpret that relationship. Words that we used before had to do with direction and strength and shape. I think those were the big three from back in the fall. Let's start with shape. It looks linear? Okay, it looks linear. Direction. Our choices are positive or negative. Positive. Meaning as one, as one variable gets bigger, the other one gets bigger as well. Okay, so uh, linear and positive, and then the last one is strength. Our choices here were weak, strong, or moderately strong, or very strong. Moderately strong. The 
this is Dr. Jones. Not a problem. Right. But you're not going to have Mr. Ross with us. Okay. Now, we had said from that earlier, from that earlier uh, class, we would actually we'd actually give the strength, we, we'd give the words that describe the strength based on the R value. Uh, and if it, the R value was really close to zero, we'd call that a weak relationship. If it was between, I think between 0.25 and 0.75, or between negative 0.25 and negative 0.75, we call that a, um, a moderately strong relationship. And if it was above 0.75 or below negative 0.75, we call that a strong relationship. Now, here's the game I want to play. Here's 222 eruptions. I want you to imagine that this is the entire population of all eruptions for Old Faithful. I want you to think, if that's the population, what would happen if I would sample out of that population? Okay? Imagine again that I took randomly chosen 20 of those observations out and did a, a linear regression on them. Each one of those collections, each one of those samples would give us a regression line with its own slope and its own vertical intercept. Would those lines of best fit all be the same for every single sample of size 20? Would they all look exactly the same? That's a yes or no question. So you could get 50 a chance of guessing and they'd be okay. It'd be a little different. It'd be a little different, says Kyle. Why would they be a little different? Because there's variation in the data, and sometimes you maybe grab a few of them and they're on the low side, and maybe that line's a little bit lower. If I do another sample, perhaps I grab some of them randomly, some of them on the higher side, and it'll be a little bit higher. But every time I grab 20, I'm unlikely to get exactly the same line. There's sampling variation, a theme that we have seen again and again and again in this class. All right. Well, Here's three samples. Sample one gave us a slope of 10.2. Sample two gave us a slope of 7.7. .7. Sample three gave us a sample of 9.5. Question. If you had to guess what the real slope was, when I say real slope, meaning that what if we looked at all 222 observations again, what would you guess about what the real slope was? Let me say this one more time. I did one sample, I got a slope of 10.2. Do we think 10.2 is the real slope? No, but it's probably close to the real slope. Second sample, we got a slope of 7.7. .7. Yes? We could probably find the average of those. It's probably somewhere in the nines. Because you got a value of 10, a value of 9, one at 7.7, .7, maybe a little bit lower than a little bit lower than 9.5. Okay, that would be reasonable. Okay, that was three samples. Can you imagine what would happen if we took all possible samples of size 20 from that population of 222 observations? Every single one of them have a little bit different slope. There'd be variation in all those Bs, a distribution of Bs. As Abby has suggested, the average of those would probably be a reasonable guess at the real slope, the slope of the 222 observations. 
this distribution of Bs. Well, Bs, we're talking about distributions again. We should go back to how do we describe distributions? What are the big three that we use to describe any distribution? Spread, center, center, shape. Excellent. So my question would be is, what is the shape of the distribution of sample Bs? Where is it centered? What is its spread? By the way, I can do the same thing with the question of A's, the, the, the vertical intercepts. Here it is. Here's 32. Here's 44. Here's 36. All of those are the vertical intercepts when I do that linear regression. That's three of them. If you had to guess, Michael Azar, what the, what the real A was, what would be a reasonable guess? Bless you. Same equation as the 10.2, about 32. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because 10.2 seems to be a good slope. Yeah. It seems like it would be reasonable to think that the, the A value of this is you okay? All right. That the A value associated with that? That's a reasonable, that's a very not what not the way I would have done it, but that's very reasonable. I would have done something like what Abby did. I would have yeah. taken fun the average and said, you know. 32 and 44 and 36, it's probably average yeah, about 36. I'm not even saying that voice. <laughs> All right, so what you said is very reasonable. Totally out of the box thinking. Good. Oh, sorry, this is too heavy. All right, so here's what I want to leave the slide with. When we do linear regression, we're just doing one sample out of a population. We're getting one B and one A. Those one B, that one B, that one slope is just one of many, in, well, not in, nearly infinite number of slopes that we can get out from doing all the numerous samples of the same size out of that population. Same thing with A. A is the A value that we get out of one sample. It's just one A out of a distribution of A. And what I really would like to know is where's the center of, that of those two distributions? More interested on the slope side than I am about the A side, by the way. All right. So slopes vary. We expect them to vary because they're sampling variation. Let's go ahead and investigate the pattern of variation in slope B as described in the sampling distribution. Again, a sampling distribution, a distribution of all possible samples of the same size coming from a population. Okay, using a uh, piece of computer software called Fathom, we can actually simulate random sample after random sample from that 222 uh, eruptions. Abby, you had brought forth the idea of using the average to estimate what the real slope is. Based on those draws, where we're seeing a dot for every one of the Bs that come out from the sample, what do you think the average, the average slope is of all, of all those samples? You can't see it. I'm going to have to redo these slides. Here. All right, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. 10-ish. Sure. OK? And then the last part would be is, do we think that is a reasonable estimate of what the real slope is? Well, you can hardly see it, but they actually drew a line because we had the 222 eruptions that are, say, are making up our population, and they drew it right there. It's really faintly drawn. It happens to be right in the center of that distribution of sample Bs. Coincidence? I think not, indeed. Okay, so sample after sample leads to distribution of Bs. 
the distribution of bees has shape, center, and spread. I wonder if we can figure out what they are. Well, let's go after the center first. In this example, a little over 10, or 10-ish, as Abby put it. Okay. How about the shape? It looks symmetric. Do we think it's normal? Does that look normal to you? Does that look skewed? It looks, normal. looks normal? Well, they suggest that we look at a normal probability plot to try to determine the normality. This is great because we haven't talked about normal probability plots in a little while. Let's go back and say, what are those ideas again? A normal probability plot takes data, runs it through an algorithm. When it plots it, if the data plots out linearly, we say that the data set is normally distributed. If there's curves in that normal probability plot, then we say that the data set is skewed, or not, at least not normal. Well, let's take a look at the normal probability plot for this. Do they have it? Nope. All they say is the normal probability plot suggests that it's approximately normal. That's great. The center is 10.32. And that's really, really close to the regression, the 10.36 if we did every single uh, all 20, 222 eruptions. Oops, wrong way. And then lastly, the spread. The spread in this case was 1.31. The actual standard deviation when we, if we actually take 222 disrupt, uh, uh, is actually 1.3. Uh, all these things are really close to the real stuff. Let's see how we can use this. Okay, new idea, big idea. Um, I'm going to write some things in so you can see some analogies. I'm going to write, this is stuff from previous sections. X bar of mu. How are they the same? How are they different? Two symbols. They have similarities. They have differences. What are they? Opposite way. We use expert to say this is a sample mean. Mu is a population mean, but they're both means. Right? Well, let me do that again. Same thing but standard deviation. Is that right, Hannah? We use S to say the sampled standard deviation, but we use sigma for. Great. P at and P, same thing, except representing what idea? Representing what idea? Proportion. So P at for our sample proportion, but P for the population proportion. Again, the whole theme of the inferential statistics sections that we've been doing, we're now in our, like, fourth chapter of this is that we typically look at sample data in order to try to figure out what's going at the population level. We can't find out what mu is, but we do have an x bar. Let's, let's use x bar to estimate what mu is, because mu is more interesting to us. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? A and B. When we do linear regression, we take the data, through it, we, put it, we put it through our linear regression procedure, and they give us back out an A and a B value. Notice that I wrote A and B in the sample column. Because typically, when we do a linear regression, we don't have everyone's data. We don't have population level data. We only have sample data, typically. If A is a sample letter, what are we going to use for population level? And the answer is, we're going to use the letter alpha again. So now we have alpha being used two different ways. One, as the 
level of significance for our inferential testing, and also we're going to say it, it's the population vertical intercept. What are we going to use for B at the population level? And the answer is we're going to use beta. So the same way that we hardly ever know mu, but we can find x bar, we hardly ever know beta, but we can find B by looking at a sample. Got the idea? I have sample data. I can do a linear regression. But what I'm really interested in is what would happen if I did a linear regression with all the data in a population, every single one of old faithful's eruptions since the beginning of time. That would take a lot of effort. Wait, humans weren't there every time it erupted. OK, can't do it. We, didn't, we can't know what beta is. But using the procedures that we're going to outline, we can make reasonable guesses at what beta is. All right. Come on. There we go. So let's talk about the, the conditions of, of regression inference. Suppose we have n observations from a, a very large population. And our goal is to try to find the linear relationship between x and y, some explanatory variable that we're going to call x, some response variable that we're going to call y. First of all, before we start trying to say there's some, some true slope or some true y-intercept, we have to first be reasonably sure that the relationship is linear to begin with. That seems, that seems responsible. I'm about to try to say there's some true linear relationship. Well, let's find out, first of all, let's make sure that the relationship is linear in general. Now, how would we do that? How would we look at a data set and say, is there indeed a linear relationship? And, well, it's a question that we actually answered earlier this year when we did, when we did um, linear regression earlier. If I have a set of data x and y, I can do a linear regression. Certainly, we can look at the scatter plot and say, does the relationship look linear? Item right number one. Chances are, if your eye thinks it spots a nonlinear relationship, it's probably really not linear. Item number two. Let's say it looks linear, but we want to double check. We run a regression on it, and there's this thing called the regression plot, sorry, not the regression plot, the residual plot. A residual plot shows us the relationship of the line of best fit to the data. And when data points are above that line, they create positive residuals. When things are below the line, they create negative residuals. And in that chapter, we said a good regression, sorry, a good residual plot will be one that looks like noise, like randomness. There should be no pattern in the residual plot. So we're going to look at those two things to determine linearity. Again, look at the scatter plot that looks linear, go to the, res the residual plot. If the residual plot shows randomness or noise, we say, I think we have a linear relationship. If we see a pattern in the scatter plot, or if we see a pattern, in, if we see a nonlinear pattern in the scatter plot, or if we see any kind of pattern in the residual plot, we've got a problem. And we will proceed with caution. All right, next item independent. <clears throat> Individual observations should be independent of each other. to a normal condition for our third condition. Any fixed value, x, and response variable, y, ver should vary according, according to a linear, sorry, normal distribution. Now, how are we going to test that? How do we test to see if all the data is in our, in our list of x values, which we typically put in list 1, 
how would we check to see whether those numbers were normally distributed? I think we answered that question about five minutes ago. And I'll pause, creating an uncomfortable silence, saying, what did we talk about five or ten minutes ago about being able to check whether a distribution was linear, or sorry, normal or not? The normal probability plot. The normal probability plot, which is the last of the six graphing types on your calculator, will take data, and if the plot is linear, the data is normal. If the plot is Nonlinear, the data, the, well, the distribution is not normal. Okay, so we have the ability to check normality by using the normal probability plot. Oh my gosh, a fourth condition. Crazy. We've never had four conditions before. Can we adjust? You're going to have to. Okay, fourth condition, equal variance. <coughs> what does that mean? Well, it means that when we look at our data, that the variation in the y's is not going to be so much different at the beginning as it is at the end. That the y's are going to vary from the line of prediction in about equal ways. Now, how are we going to test that condition? And the answer is, I want you to, let me draw a picture. Let me draw a picture to do that. So here's our x data, and here's our y data. Here's a line of best fit. Here's data surrounding that line of best fit. You see these distances here? These residuals there? Do they look about even throughout the data? They're about the same distance at the beginning, just a little bit away, as they are in the end, in the middle. The variation of the data in the y direction is about equal throughout the entire data set. Now, probably the easiest way to look at that variation is to look at the residual plot, where on the x-axis we still have x data, but on the y-axis we now look at the residuals for each of those data, piece of data. So here we are, that little, that one little there. Oh, that's just a little bit below the prediction line, so it's got a little bit of a negative residual. This one, a little bit of a higher residual. This one, negative. This one, positive and a little bit higher. This data point right there has a positive residual. That data point there, a negative residual. But we look at the residual plot, and we say, does the variation vertically in that residual plot seem about the same throughout the entire data set. If it does, we say we have equal variance. Now, let me do a counter example. Let me show you a plot that doesn't have equal variance. And actually, that exercise that we ran last week could be a good example. Last week, we did a plot of actual age versus predicted age. Uh, and we had celebrities. Do you remember this? Yeah, I remember this like, like it was last week. Because it was last week. All right. So we had something like this. We had actual ages. All right. And down at this end of the, of the spectrum were people like uh, Justin Bieber. Did we have Justin Bieber? Who did we have in there? We didn't have Whitney Houston that list. 
with Betty White, but Betty White was up here because her actual age was 90. Will Smith. Will Smith was in the 40s, right? Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman was up here. I think we had Johnny Depp in this area, but down here we had, was that Gomez? Gomez? I can't, I'm, the problem is I did this in two different classes and we used different set of, uh, two different sets of celebrities. No, I mixed that, I really would like you not, I was ignoring it now, I need you to stop, right? Do you understand me? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, but we had young celebrities too. Who did we have on the young, on the, on the, on the young side? We didn't have any young people? Oh, yeah. We had the one basketball. Oh, Gork? Yeah, Gordon Drogic. Gordon Drogic. Okay, so he was he was young. Who else did we have? We had, okay, but here, okay, trying to, trying to bring this back to what we need to talk about. If I were to do the residual plot of this, of this data, you might see that for people of young ages, it's relatively easy to get close to their age. For, that, for the, uh, the NBA player, I think you guessed like, that he was like 23, and he was 25. Okay, but it was, it's hard to get 10 years off on his age. He's a relatively new player. You're not going to guess 40. You're not going to guess 15. Sorry, I guess if he's 26, you're not going to guess 36, and you're not going to guess 16. You're not going to go 10, 10 years away. You're not going to likely get 10 years away. But for people like Betty White, where I think Jacob put her, put her in like 68 or something like that. No, that's my point. Okay, but you could, it's easy to get really far away on their ages. It's easy to underrate Betty White's age by 20 years. It's easy to call her 70 when she's really 90. I think you said she was like 17. I think I said she was 17. I was off by 18 years. That's all the facelifts. Exactly. What's that? That's all the facelifts. Okay. My point is that the variation in the residuals gets bigger over time for that particular example. If we were trying to compare this against the condition of equal variances, this kind of situation would likely fade or fail because our drift from the predicted line and the actual line would actually probably be pretty big. Okay. So, four conditions for doing inference having to do with regression. Linear, independent, normal, equal variance. And you'll see, of course, that those things are listed on your scaffolding sheet. You, of course, will have access to that scaffolding sheet when you take the quiz. You will not have access to that scaffolding sheet when you take the test. All right. Oh, a fifth condition. What? Random. Isn't this the only way we, in, we are able to ensure that the data is unbiased? Okay, so five conditions in total. Linear, independent, the x and the y data both have to be normal, and then uh, there has to be equal variance, meaning the residuals have to be equally spread throughout the data set, and then lastly, of course, our data set has to be randomly chosen. Okay, we're at 838. 838. Uh, we got one more slide before I'm going to let you go. Let's talk about this last slide. What's going on? This is actually trying to get you to think about this data three-dimensionally. Now, we know that when we get regression data, we end up with a line of best fit in the form of A plus BX. If we were able to do it with the entire population data, we'd end up with a line of best fit in the form of alpha plus beta X. Right? Now, we also know that 
even though there may be a relationship between x and y, that relationship usually is not perfectly linear. It does not create perfect prediction. That for any given x, for any given x, while there, for any given x, while there is a point on the line of best fit, it says this would be my best prediction. The y values actually are found above and below that line. That there's variation in the y direction. We don't have perfect predictability. Here's an idea. For any given x, the distribution of y values varies. Like a distribution. And with every single distribution, what do we like? Center, spread, and shape. Well, how about the center of that distribution is the, the point on the prediction line? How about the shape of that distribution of different y values for particular x values is, is normal? All right. That will finish it up. We are on slide 10 of 28. We'll finish this up tomorrow. Uh, look forward to a quiz on Wednesday.